Good morning, everyone. Um, so for, I've been, I've, uh, I'm a speaker. I, I speak at conferences uh, a lot, and um, I've been talking about event-driven systems for uh, some years now uh, because I, I really think they're very, very interesting. And I've been building systems using it as a developer advocate. So I, you know, I've, I've got like decades of experience as a back-end, uh, you know, like Java developer, back-end systems. So now I get to build systems for fun and demos and things like that. But uh, I've been fascinated with event-driven. And over the last year, I've been using something else. And the hint is it's called this, uh, Calyx. But um, that's kind of changed my perspective on how to do software, and especially how to do event-driven software. So I think event-driven software is very, very interesting. And, but this, this approach that I'm going to kind of show you as well I think is interesting also. So maybe you'll think I'm crazy. Some of my colleagues think I'm crazy because I'm talking about you know, this like neural processing with event-driven. But we'll see. You, you know, you'll be the judge. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'll do a review of event-driven because I think a lot of people have heard about it. You know, if, you're a, if you're a back-end developer or, or even you know, full-stack developer. Uh, but many people haven't used it. And then I'm going to show you a bit of code don't have a lot of time, but I want to show you a little bit of code and, and a, a different style of code as well. And then I'm going to go crazy on you and, and get into this uh, concept of this, uh, what I call MicroMind. I've been playing with a name, you know, uh, neurosynaptic services and MicroMind, those types of things. But it's an interesting processing pattern. So with event-driven, one of the things I've been working on is a demo that's been a lot of fun for me, and uh, it, it's called Earthship. And the reason it's called Earthship is that the user interface that I built is uh, a map. You know, it's like a Google map, so you can go anywhere on the Earth, and you can zoom in to a location on, on the, the, the map, and then you can pick a circular region, like you can see the circular regions here, and, you can, and then you can say, I want to create a simulated number of orders. You know, so this is like an e-commerce system. This is like you know, the shopping cart uh, demo is kind of like the hello world for back-end applications. So I started with this, this simple shopping cart app, but that got boring really, really fast. So I wanted to make this more interesting. And I wanted to do more interesting things with the demo app. But I always like to do this visual stuff so that you can, um, and this is on GitHub. I got QR codes where you can go grab the repo. But the idea is you, you zoom into a location on the map, anywhere in the map you want. You could be in the middle of the ocean, or it could be you know, over a city, or wherever you want to do it. And then you, can, then you can specify how many orders do you want to create. You want to create some, like a, hundred, a couple hundred orders. You want to create a thousand orders. But what I wanted to do is kind of have this demo put a hurt on the back end system, really put a load on this system. And another thing you can set is a rate, like you know, the orders per second type of a rate. Then one click goes into this demo app, and it starts generating a bunch of orders. So all these dots represent orders that were randomly distributed within the circular region. So, so this is a design diagram of this application. I'm not going to be able to go into a lot of detail with it, but I want, I want it, it's a, it is event-driven. So these rectangular boxes represent basically event-driven microservices, but they're of a very specific type. They, they're probably not like maybe what you've seen with other event-driven before, because they're very focused on what they do. But what I wanted to do was, show kind of visually what happens. So you can see in the bottom left, there's a client. I'm kind of highlighting a client, and it's sending in a command to a shopping cart service, and it's adding, a, say, an, um, items to a shopping cart. So it's loading up a shopping cart. But the interesting thing is when the command comes in from the client to say, checkout. So the, the service is emitting an event, checkout. Now, this is where things get interesting. That event is of interest downstream to another service, which is to create an order. So that triggers the creation of an order. So this is an event-driven flow. There's kind of a cascading sequence of events. But like I say, this got boring really, really fast. So I wanted to plug in this, this UI. So the map in the top center there is sending in a single HTTP request to say, you know, I create 500 orders at this geographic location within this circular region. So that goes into another service, which starts triggering the creation of these orders. But you can see there's a flow, like this, this um, generator got the initial request. It starts emitting events 
over and over to create uh, these, uh, what I call geo orders. And these geo orders are just orders at a specific geographic location. But here you can see the event coming out of geo order is of interest to a couple other services. And the point I want to make here is that each of these services, you know, one of the things we've been talking about with microservices forever is they're supposed to be loosely coupled. And these are, loose, these are loosely coupled services. These services have an API, but they don't know who gave it, you know, send up com commands. These services also emit events, but they don't know who or what consumes those events. They don't care. So every single service is only concerned with its own functioning. It's not concerned with the rest of the system. So this geo order service emits an event which happens to be of interest because of the wiring of the system to a couple of other services. But now we go deeper into the processing flow here. And I'm not going to go through what's happening here, but other than what this system does is allocate stock to the orders. So it's doing something a little bit more interesting than just taking orders in. But you can see there's this kind of cascading flow of events that are coming in. Uh, get rid of this thing here and what it is. That, you know, where, where the processing is occurring. So all the, these, these highlights are these cascading flows for where commands come into one service, it emits an event, that event gets picked up by another one. So the logic of this system is built in, it's kind of decomposed down into these individual, very focused little services that are wired together to orchestrate the whole processing of the system where it takes orders in, allocates stock to them, and reports back to, um, to what the processing is. So this is the, the general flow of the system. This is a really different way to design a system. Uh, if you, if you, you know, I, like I said, I've built backend systems for decades and you know, with regular databases and uh, uh, CRUD-like operations, you know, multi-table transactions and all those types of things, this is not uh, that type of behavior. So the design of this application was really interesting where I, you know, I, I decompose a problem down into each of these services is solving a different part of the problem and uh, it, it has this processing flow, and, uh, including things like allocating stock to the order. So that's kind of what this demo does. This is, it's a fun demo to run visually on the map when the, the orders are, are first shown, they're grayed out, indicating, okay, the order's there, but we haven't processed it yet. And then just over a period of a few seconds when it runs, the orders will turn blue when they're allocated stock, or they'll tell, turn red when there's insufficient stock, so the orders go into a back order state. But that triggers other behavior that's in this, these, uh, this design, which will order more stock. And as that stock comes into the system, that stock goes looking for back orders and fulfills those back orders so that you know, the, all the orders get uh, processed. Now, the other interesting thing is that the, there's three fundamental components that are used to, to, to build this system in this, this uh, uh, platform. There's the rectangular services, they're called entities. And like I say, they, you know, they have an API. It's a simple API, I'll show you the code in just a, in, in, uh, just a minute. They uh, have logic, you know, basically, you know, th there's a, you know, the, the service composes the state of a thing. It's like this shipping order item, for example, that's um, uh, in, in the middle of this diagram. It's just a durable object, basically. That, that this thing is processing. And then it's emitting events. Now, as, as event-driven, the events are for changing the state. You know, like with a, with a shopping cart, you add an item to the cart. Well, that's a command coming in. If the cart's not checked out, you know, you run the business logic. If the cart's not checked out and the, it's a real product and everything looks good, then the item gets added to the cart, which means you're altering the state of the shopping cart by emitting an event. So the, the processing is a command comes in, it creates an event, the event gets persisted, and once it's safely persisted, then the event is used to alter the state of the object, and that's the processing flow. So the big difference here is that these services are really simple. They don't reach out, they don't talk to databases uh, directly. The state is recovered from the event journal. So like, you know, what is the current state of a shopping cart well, it's got, you know, add item three times, change an item quantity, remove an item quantity, check out. The aggregate of all those events is the current state of the, of the shopping cart. This is the basic behavior of these, these services. 
So let me show you a little bit of code. Here's the shopping cart service. It's in Java. Um, anybody Java Spring developers here? Some? Yeah. So some of this should look familiar. You know, the API is definitely using Spring-like annotations. But you can see that on this line um, here, number 26, you know, I, I just I have a class and it extends a base class. It's called an event source entity. This is part of this, the software development kit here, this, this Calix software development kit. But then here you can see, here's how you define in uh, part of the API, like uh, add an item to the cart. But the, the main thing I want to show you here, because there's a lot happening right on this line 49, you can see there's above, it's like effects.emit event. So what that is, that's the code that emits a, a new event that needs to be persisted by the underlying system. So this is a high abstraction. Kind of, uh, I just gave a talk earlier this week at another conference about high abstraction platforms. And Calyx is one of them, but I, I talked about four different ones. These are uh, higher abstraction platforms that are abstracting away as much uh, uh, detail as possible. So this code does not connect to a database directly. It's connected to a database indirectly through the, the layer, the platform layer that's below it. So it, the goal is to simplify development. So here it's like emit an event. I don't know where it goes. I don't know what the database is. I don't care. That's the problem of the platform. My problem is worrying about the business logic in this service. So it emits an event. The next interesting thing is this current state. The current state is an inherited method from the base class which composes, you know, has the state of this, of this thing, you know, like in this case, a shopping cart, as it is right now, retrieved from the database. This is also a stateful service, meaning that this, the state will be cached, kind of in a very kind of elegant caching mechanism where if, it, if the shopping cart's active and there's a, you know, there's a user adding you know, things to the cart, that cart's in memory somewhere in a cluster. There's one instance of it in memory somewhere in a cluster. And it's just, instead of having to retrieve the state every single time you're going to make a change, it's just, it has it in there. But all that's being managed by the platform as well. You just, you, know, you access in our code the state from this current state. And then um, this event for is a method I wrote. It's just my style, but it's really simple. Um, it's just taking the command in and, and uh, uh, creating the, the event back. Uh, and returning that. So these APIs, you can see the, the, the API, like, you know, add an item, change an item, remove an item, check out. This, this is all I'm doing. And then the next thing here is these event handlers. So the event handlers are invoked once the event has been safely persisted to the database. And, um, the, you know, it, and we want to now make the state change. So if you look at this method, you can see that it's returning the state. Okay, so that's the state of the shopping cart, altered by the event. So like with the, with the um, add item, I'll take a, go into this on method. You can see this is just basic Java. All I'm, you know, the, uh, the, the object here has a list of items in the, in the shopping cart. So all I'm doing is streaming through the list and adding, an, uh, adding the new item to the shopping cart. Very simple, no database. Um, and no, nothing like that. So those, there's all these event handlers for the different events. And then the state itself is just a Java record. And I really love Java records. It's one of the best inventions come out in Java uh, because they're immutable. So that means that I can't write code where I'm going to screw up and change the state when I sh you know, shouldn't have or something like that. So it's really quite nice. But the, uh, I have these event, you know, just kind of overloaded event for methods for all my different commands. And then I have the on methods, overloaded on methods for all the different events. And that's the, the basic flow of this, of this class. So no database connections, no uh, worrying about publishing messages, things like that. But you, you can see that there's messaging happening in this system because the event from a shopping cart, like a checkout, is being picked up and processed by downstream services. So the other component that I wanted to show you is um, the shopping cart to order. And 
Here, I just want to show you really quickly so I can move on. The, this is called an action. And actions process the messages from upstream events. So the event comes into the action, and the action translates, uh, say, a checkout into a create order command. And it sends that, that create order command to the downstream service, the order service, to create an order from the, the shopping cart. So the logic in here is really simple. I'm not involved in um, pulling or anything like that or you know, talking to Kafka or whatever. High abstraction uh, type of, of code to do that. So that's kind of the, the, the code. So I want to get into the, uh, the micromind piece here. I'm going to go a little crazy on you. And when I was working on this design diagram, and I, the, 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 my goal for that design diagram where I was showing kind of the cascading sequences of events was to, to help people visualize you know, a, a flow and, a, and kind of an, a real event-driven type of a system. And I thought it worked out pretty well. But it took a lot of work. I, I, if you guys uh, ever heard of Blender, Blender.org is a fantastic 3D tool, and I love Blender. And I'm going to show you something else that I've done in Blender in just a minute that just I love. But uh, so this diagram I did in Blender, but it was a lot of work to do all this animation of you know highlighting each step as a, of the processing flow. But you know it's, it's like when I was looking at it, it's like okay, wait a minute. The way these services are working. And the way there's this kind of cascading sequence of events that's occurring between the services, I started to think, wait, this is somewhat like the behavior of you know, the neurons in biological brains. Neurons in biological brains have a state. You know, they have a, like a charge. They get signals in from other neurons or other um, you know, sensors, like you know, touch or pain or whatever. But the the neuron itself doesn't know who sent it a signal. All it knows is it received a signal. The neuron decides, should it emit a signal? So it, it decides it emits a signal. It doesn't know or care who is, is uh, wired up to receive that signal. All the neuron knows is, is his basic mechanics. And that's kind of what these services are doing here. Really simple, really focused, not complicated, not doing uh, database transactions. It's kind of a pure, kind of an event-driven type of thing where Signals come in and signals go out, and there's some logic in the, in the middle to decide when, you know, how to respond to incoming signals and how to uh, uh, emit outgoing signals. So that kind of blew my mind because, you know, this, like I said, the, you know, shipping order, it gets a command in, does a state chain, emits an event, that event gets picked up by an action because it's subscribed to it. That action takes that event and translates it into a command and sends it down to another uh, service. There's your flow. So it kind of blew me away. So again, just kind of walk, walking through it really quick, you can see this cascading sequence of events. You, you know, step by step, this is the exact flow of the way this, this application works. And what it's doing, it's not just taking in orders, like I said, it's allocating stock. And what this system is doing, with just these 13 simple services, it remembers exactly where every physical unit of stock went to every single order. All that is being handled. It's also handling back orders. Like when there's insufficient stock in the system, and when stock comes into the system, it has logic to add stock to the back ordered orders, find them and, and allocate stock to them. All this behavior is in a relatively simple uh, uh, service. So. That's what's kind of cool here. Again, my colleagues think, some, think I'm nuts talking about this whole neural thing, whatever. But I, I don't know. I'm pretty psyched about it. The other thing that I thought was really interesting was that there were behaviors that were starting to emerge, recurring behaviors that I hadn't seen before in other code. So for example, there's, a, like, uh, there's like um, five or six recurring behaviors. I'll give you a summary at the end. But of the 13 uh, services here, Three of them kind of use the same uh, kind of a hierarchical tree pattern. I call it a reduction tree. And once I figured out what a, you know, how, how to use a reduction tree in this kind of a processing, and this isn't unique to Calix. This, I think, is unique to this style of doing event-driven, that these patterns started to emerge. So there's all these different reusable patterns that are starting to emerge here. And that intrigued me even more, that um, maybe there's something really interesting happening here. Because I, I'm starting to think that 
the way our brains, you know, uh, biological neural networks are, are put together, it's the same type of thing. There's these recurring patterns in the way that all the things are wired together that, that, that are being used to do very, very powerful things. So it's this whole idea of um, you know, services behaving more like neurons and other functions and behaving like synapses. By the way, this is all serverless as well on this platform. So these things are running in a cluster. They're, they're getting allocated when, when needed. It scales up, it scales down, those types of things. So um, what I want to show you is a, uh, another visualization of processing um, the services. So what I did was, um, before I play it, because I got time, uh, I, I wrote specific log statements in the application so that, that I could scrape those log, specific log statements out of the log and use that as raw data to render the activity within the, uh, the Earthship demo as it was processing orders. So what happens here is that that's one shopping cart getting processed and uh, stock getting allocated in the system. And then the two other shopping carts come in. But the fun part starts here, like, there it goes. Now 200 orders are coming in from the, the map. And what's happening here, every dot represents an instance of one of the services getting created. And the colors represent state changes that are occurring. So red indicates back orders. And, which is, and yellow indicates things that haven't been processed yet. So it's processing. And green indicates that, yeah, the stock's been allocated to the order. And it's, it's flowing back up. So you can see. It's fighting, uh, it's ac actually uh, recognizing that the system's out of stock, that triggers stock getting ordered, coming into the system and getting processed. And, the, and you can see things turn from ye you know, yellow to, to red to green, and, and everything gets processed. And uh, the lines you know, that were flashing represents the specific messages, you know, like event came from a specific entity to another specific entity. So these, are, these lines aren't arbitrary. This is real data from the running of the application. And it's 3D. So this is the beauty of Blender. Uh, um, I wrote this code, by the way. It's Python. Blender has a massive Python API. I've been wanting to do this for years. I've been using Blender for a long time. Um, but I used ChatGPT to help me write the, the Python code to do this. So this was a blast. I was so happy when this, this uh, video worked because what I think is really interesting here is I don't know if, uh, if you watch videos on, say, the processing of neural networks or the processing, you know, they, some videos are on YouTube, on, you know, say, like, of insect brains or you know, human brain activity and all those types of things, really awesome-looking videos. And I wanted to have a video like this but for a software system. So this is, this is a... Uh, about 10,000 entities were created, about 15,000 events happened you know, as processing all these, um, these uh, 200, 200 orders. And then I've, I already know some optimizations that I can do to this to cut things down some more. But um, the other thing is that this system is, you know, it's built to run on a fully distributed environment. You know, scale up, scale down. Um, any part of this application can break. And when it comes back up, the system picks up where it left off. It will not, it will keep running until it's finished its processing. Unlike AI systems like large language models, which, you know, have you heard about it? it'll lie to you with confidence or that they hallucinate like ChatGPT and everything? Yeah, I've seen it do it. You know, you, you ask it a question, it says, oh yeah, here's the answer. You look at it and go, no, that's not, that's not the answer. You're, you're, you're smoking something. Um, the, uh, this system is not you know, trained. It's hardwired. It's, like it's got instinctive behavior, not uh, trained behavior. So it's enterprise precise. You know, like we're using these patterns to do things like financial processing. And with financial processing, it's like you don't go back to your management and to your, your, your business sponsors and say, oh, it works most of the time. Every once in a while, we'll screw, up, screw something up a little bit. No, no, that, that doesn't fly, right? Um, so this is absolutely precise type of processing. You know, it, and for example, decrementing stock. This knows exactly what's happening with stock. It won't make a mistake with stock. It won't make a mistake, say, 
aggregating uh, financial transactions into merchant payments. That's another system uh, that we uh, worked on recently. Those types of things. So it's fully in distributed, fully scalable, fully re you know, resilient, uh, and absolutely accurate. And the nice thing is, is that I write this code, and I'm really kind of focused on the pattern of the code, not worried about resiliency, not worried about scale, not to, those types of things. I mean, yeah, I mean you're, of course, when you, you're doing IOs, you're always thinking about, you know, can I in my code, can I reduce the number of IOs that my code is doing? Those types of things. But it's a whole different way of thinking about uh, building, building applications. So to kind of wrap up, uh, what I like about this approach is that the microservices are, behave more like neurons. I've been talking about microservices um, since pretty much since they came out. And some of the things we've been talking about, talking about but not necessarily doing, is things like microservices should do one thing and do it well. In this case, you're, you're kind of forced to do it that way. You know, and, and the behavior of the microservices, commands come in, commands emit events, events get persisted, and then the events trigger state changes. That's the flow. The, those actions, those synaps, synaptic type actions, they're just uh, consuming events you know, from upstream event producers. And they're, for the most part, they're translating those events into downstream commands. They can do other things, like they can do queries against uh, uh, views and, and things like that. Like, for example, uh, when I'm allocating stock to the order, I def, you know, the action has to do a query to see if there's any available stock for, uh, to be allocated, and, and it grabs that stock from the query. The messaging in the system, it's, I, I don't know or care how it's implemented. I don't, you know, it, well, I, I do know, but I don't care, because uh, I work for the company that, you know, that built it, and I talk to the engineers that built the platform all the time. But that's not my concern as a developer. As a developer, I'm focused on wiring together the flows, divide, the, defining the flows, designing the flows, and, you know, in my software at a very high level of abstraction. Um, but the messaging is at least once. But that also means that you have to consider item potency. And, uh, you know, meaning that with at least once messaging, what that means is the consumer of the message will get a message at least once, and it might get that same message twice. So if you're doing things like decrementing the balance of an account or taking inventory out of a stock or something like that, you have to think about that. How, do you, how are you going to handle uh, the processing logic when, when those types of things happen. So I mentioned the patterns in, in the Earthship, relatively simple you know, demo. There's two, it's called choreographed sagas. The choreographed saga is a saga, the saga pattern without a controller. So that the saga happens just because of the way things are wired together. There's a lot of these actions that do one to many, meaning that one event comes into the action, but it emits multiple commands to multiple downstream services. That's a very common pattern. There's generation loops and generation trees. Um, this reduction tree I mentioned earlier, uh, there's three of them in the demo. Uh, it, and the reduction tree is really for that. It's reducing something like, how many back orders do I have for a particular product? How many, uh, how many uh, uh, with the stock orders are, they're in, how much inventory do I have for a particular product? The, the reduction of all that detailed data is being handled by these uh, reduction trees, and it, they're really there for, for item potency. So, th like I said, this is a different way of thinking about doing event-driven. Um, maybe you don't have a platform that, that does it, but so that's okay, because I think event-driven itself is, um, is right there. So we did a review looked at some of the adventure in architecture, looked at a bit of code, and uh, when it's this micromind. And we'll leave you with two things. This quote from Alvin Toffler, the, the literate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. I had to unlearn a ton of stuff to, and relearn new ways of doing things to use this new tool set. It was, um, it was hard. Uh, I think we've discovered some patterns that will help people that follow us uh, be, uh, later on, 
But this is a skill set that I think every one of us needs to have if we're in IT. And this one's relatively new. AI not, will not replace you. People using AI will. I, I use AI like all the time. This, all, most of the images that are in my presentation are AI created. Um, I use, I've been using Copilot for a year. Um, you know, uh, GitHub Copilot in, in uh, my, my IDD, IDE for a year. It's amazing. It's like I'm sitting there, every once in a while I'm working at home and I come out to my wife and it's like this thing's in my head, it just reads my mind. It's just dumping out blocks of code and I'm just moving. Um, it's, it's amazing. So thank you very much. This is the QR code for the, the slide deck and uh, I think we have a few minutes for uh, some Q&A if you guys have any questions. Yes, sir. That's a really good question. The only reason that particular service, the shopping cart service, had that validation checks in it was because there was a client, an external client, talking to it. The other services, and I, I think what you're getting at is when, you, when you're cascading, you know, wiring services together, a service just can't reject, right? So this is very insightful, excellent question. Uh, the service has to have like a compensating action. So, what I, instead of just saying, no, I, I, I can't process this message, it'll emit an event saying, no, I didn't process this message. And that event goes back, uh, is wired to go back to, say, the, the event producer. That's a very common pattern that was, that was in this type of a system. But uh, uh, so you have to be very careful about uh, just throwing, you know, uh, rejecting incoming commands. And it's only really for services that are on the edge of the, you know, of, of the system, you know, where there's external clients uh, that aren't event-driven clients and, and can handle the, the error response. Any other questions? No, it doesn't. Not in this system. It's, it's not, um, not yet at least. <laughs> uh, so it, it, it's, what you mean like training it with, yeah. So it, that's uh, an important distinction that the service, the behavior that's in this system, I, I, I kind of re refer to it as instinctual. You know, like when we're born and when other organisms are born with a neural network brain, there's a certain amount of uh, pre-wired behavior in the system that doesn't need to be learned. And that's kind of what uh, analogous to what this system is doing. It's just pre-wired behavior. But what's interesting about this, I think, is that how powerful that pre-wired behavior can be. Like, don't put your hand into a fire because you put, you know, when you feel pain, you immediately react. A lot of that is instinctual behavior. It's not learned behavior. Some of it is, but, but it's, you know, like insects, for example, they have some learning ability, but they have a ton of uh, pre-wired behavior built into them. And that's kind of what this is, but it's extremely powerful. That's what's kind of surprising me. It's like, man, I'm doing all this stuff with just these 13 simple services. The code's not complicated. The, you know, the, the, it's the wiring together that makes this, the behavior of the system really interesting. Yes, sir. There's, um, there's a state of each instance, right? Like there's a state of a shopping cart, state of an order, state of stock, state of product, you know, those types of things. And you have to think about that as you're designing the system. That's the fun part, the part I really enjoy of doing this, is thinking through the design, thinking through the compensating actions. You know, you kind of have a happy path where everything works just fine. That's kind of the easy path. But then there's the unhappy path. So things like... There's um, services that, you know, like an order comes in and the order's decomposed down into its individual physical units of stock that it needs, and those physical units of order, you know, stock that need, they, they go looking for individual units of stock in the inventory. And there's a, you know, like it'll send in a request to one that's supposed to be available, and that one's not available. 
So it emits an event that says, sorry, I, you know, I can't join with you because I'm, I'm unavailable. Some, some other order got me. So that event goes back to the requester, which triggers it to just try and get you know, something else. But maybe there's no more stock the next time it goes back. So you have to think through that. Like, so what happens when there's no stock? You know, and uh, so every single you, um, step you have to think through. It's not as bad as I feared it might be, especially when you're decomposing the problem into these small processing units. That's where it, I think it makes it simple. If you have a big bulky service that's getting, you know, kind of, it's got that smell because it's getting too big, then you know you're on the wrong track. And often the solution when I ran into that was to decompose it down into smaller, delegate, you know, to smaller services. But you have to think about, um, make sure. I think we're out of time, so thank you very much for attending the talk.